of breaking God's law. They're guilty of, of a crime. And uh, we're going to talk about those fallen angels, and we're going to talk about what they did here. We'll read these, the text here, and then we'll get right into it here. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply in the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And that, that's scary that God, I mean, we all know this, but we don't think about it sometimes, that God knows the, the imagination of our hearts, and he sees the imagination of our hearts. So he sees what we allow to chamber in our imagery. There are sometimes that things are thrown into your mind that you don't want, Spurgeon used to call those the devil's brats, his grandpa did, that would come into your mind and they didn't want those thoughts you know, at all. They rejected them. That's one way to handle it. If you don't do it the biblical way by casting down imaginations and every high thing, but you, that you also you chamber wicked thoughts in your mind and you allow them and you, you feed them and you don't reject them and cast them down, God sees that. So God sees what you do with your thoughts. You, can, you and I can always, can, cannot always control the things that come into our mind. But what we do have the power of when we're saved by the grace of God, we have the power to cast them down. I have had times in my life where those thoughts would not stop. I could not stop them from my mind from, from having them and from them continuing and from them from those thoughts happening and there was like a thousand of them at one time and they just kept it was like a thousand voices speaking in your head at the same time and it would not stop I could not stop that but what I had a responsibility to do was not listen not 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 entertain it right I had a responsibility to cast it down because that's what Jesus said I didn't have a responsibility to figure out where it came from that God never told us that he just said to cast it down he said, cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. It's enough that it comes from a depraved heart. Yeah, but pastor, you don't understand how absolutely wicked sometimes my thoughts can be and how horrible and how disgusting and how terrible and how, well, I do. I, I, I do. Just because you've never heard me say those things in public doesn't mean that I've not been through some of those same things because I, <laughs> I spent a lot of time going through some of those same things. And, and many... It, we're not supposed to share with people the thoughts of our hearts, right? We're to share those with God. We, we're not Roman Catholics. We don't have confession time, right? Where everybody just stand up and tell me the worst thing you've ever thought. Don't do that. No. Don't share that with anybody. See, God sees your thoughts, the thoughts of your heart. You take those to God. Every last one of them. But pastor, I can't talk to God about those. Those thoughts are so wicked and evil. He already knows they're there. That's why he tells you to cast him down. That's why he tells you to ask for forgiveness. That's why he tells you to take him to God. If you're, you say, but I'm afraid of those things. Good, tell God you're afraid of them. Be very specific that you're afraid of these things. Lord, I'm afraid of those things. I don't want that. I don't want that. I don't want that to be true, and I'm afraid of that. Well, tell God that you're afraid of it. Tell him and ask him for his strength, and he'll give it to you. And you ought to be afraid of evil. You ought to be afraid of wickedness. You ought to be afraid of that. There ought to be a healthy fear of that. But take it to God, who's the only one that can fix that. Amen? He's the only one that can help sustain you. That, by the way, though, that doesn't mean that those thoughts all ended. I remember <laughs> I would walk around this room, and I would be yelling almost when I was praying, when I was crying out to God. For I, One time it was three hours. For three hours straight, I walked around this room, and I literally cried out to God for three hours straight about every thought, about everything that was plaguing my mind, about everything that was, was, was hurting, everything that was the grief and the, and the heartache that I had, the most scariest, vile, terrible things that went through my head, I, I would just cry out to God over it. And I had to do it for, th one day I did it for three hours straight. I looked up at the clock and it was like three hours later. And I just, I paced this room. All the way around. Amen. But you know what? God's good. He's faithful. 
God will take care of you no matter where you're at. Amen. But you got to take it to the Lord. You can't try it yourself. You won't ever, it won't work. And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. And children, you pay attention after this service quickly, right after we're done here, I'm going to ask you some questions. Okay? And we're all done with everything. So you, you be paying attention to everything closely. If you fall asleep, your dad's going to poke you. All right? Maybe your mom. Maybe your sister will flick your ear. Faith, you look like you wanted to flick John's ear. I don't know. That looked a little... She was like, are you serious? Am I going to get permission to flick his ear right now? Because I might just take that. Just a friendly little flick, John. That's all. Right? Uh-oh. Dad's looking down his glasses. I don't think so. <laughs> anyway let's pray father in heaven lord thank you for your word thank you for the truth thank you that we have the bible to, to learn from it's in our own language lord it's right here for us we have the words of life right before us we have everything you want us to know lord thank you for that help us to love the word of god in jesus name we pray amen all right, so we talked about these fallen angels, right? What did the angels do that was, that, were, that was so heinous and so wicked? You know, the Bible, it describes what happened here, but the implications of it we find later. You know, God said he's going to destroy the world. Uh, not just because, here's what people say. Well, if you're saying that God destroyed the earth because of giants and you're, you're, trying, to, you're trying to say that God didn't destroy the earth because of man's sin. No, it's because man worked with the devil. Just like, by the way, just like at the end, when man works with Satan, the same way, he's going to do the same thing when God destroys the earth, and God's going to destroy this, so he's going to melt it all down with fervent. Why? Because Satan works with man. It's like a microcosm of what's going to happen. It's, it's all pictured. It's, a, it's prophetic to picture what's going to happen. No one's going to be able to say, well, you're saying that God's going to destroy the earth because of uh, Satan. No, it's because Satan's going to gather up a one world government and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil and they're going to choose the devil over God. Right? They're going to follow him. Just like Eve did in the garden. Right? Same thing. So, yeah, that was the plan that Satan had, right? Sons of God, daughters of men, the fallen. By the way, I tried to get the cleanest pictures I could. You can't imagine how many perverted things are. Don't imagine, please. But they're, they're the most awful things out there. You could, you could type in angels in heaven, and they have perverted pictures of women. I'm not kidding you. It's, yeah, yeah, it's just it's that bad, right? So I, I tried to do. Now, this is not Dave. I'll show you a picture of Dave in a minute. But um, this, this right here is some confusion because the first thing you're asking yourself is, wait a minute. I thought Jesus said that angels uh, couldn't, right? We talked about this earlier, that angels couldn't, uh, they didn't have bodies or Jesus said that they, Jesus specifically said in Mark chapter 12, for when they shall rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. And Matthew 22, 30, for in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage but are as the angels of God in heaven. But they which shall be counted, or accounted worthy to obtain the world and the resurrection of the dead neither marry or are given in marriage. So we see those verses and we think, well, that's what it says. Neither can they die anymore, for they are equal unto the angels and are the children of God, being the children of the resurrection. Notice how he likened the children of God with likened unto the angels. They are, they are, like, they are equal unto the angels. That's your, the, the future body of man. In that sense, regenerated, renewed man, redeemed man completely is going to have a body like an angel. That's, that's the body that they're going to have. Very similar to that. Same thing. Jesus says it over and over again. What, that's the body that Jesus had after the resurrection, which we'll kind of talk to at the, about at the end. Every single reference, right? Jesus talked about angels not marrying. But he always said, and many Bible expositors, like we said here, do not like to talk about this subject. It's taboo to them. You know, they don't want to be labeled as some kind of kook. They don't want to be a weirdo. But it's too late for me. <laughs> I've, I've, already, I've, I've already been 
I I'm already, it's too late, right? <laughs> Being that guy down there, it's too late for us. We've already been labeled kooks. So I might as well run with it, right? I might as well teach what the Bible says. Which hat do you like better, by the way? Do you like that? You like that one? Where did I get that one at? Did I steal that from you? Oh, that's Charity's hat. Well, I have the red one. Mine's better. Anyway, so it's too late. It's too, it's too late for me, right? It's over, right? Uh, they already think I'm a kook, so that, that's okay. Mark chapter 12, verse number 25. For when they shall, ri sh they shall rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. In heaven. In heaven. The one thing you're going to notice over and over again is in heaven. In heaven. The context is those angels that are in heaven, right? For in the resurrection. Man, I really would love to talk about the resurrection for and the implications of the resurrection for like hours. And I, I probably will someday um, consecutively. But, you know, here's a, because there's so much about the resurrected body and about the resurrection. We don't really talk about it much. Honestly, we talk about, I mean, we preach the gospels, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And we, we, you have to focus on the two-thirds bad part so you can get to the good part, which is the resurrection, right? There's the death, the burial, and then there's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then there's the resurrection for us and our resurrected bodies and what our life will one day be like. You know what? We need to think about that more. We need to think about the future, what God's going to do with us. Because every pain that you have you, and every, every soreness you have, and as you age and everything else, you need to remember that one day this old vile flesh is going to go into the ground. And one day God's going to raise it up out of that ground, and he's going to raise it up to be new. He's going to raise it up to be perfect one day. And you need to get excited about that and think about the future of what God's going to do. Because you know what? This is, just, this is your proving time for the Lord. This is your time to prove how much you love God. That's it. You only have a short window. This is all you have. With your life, all you have is a short time to prove how much you love God. Amen? For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. But they which shall be accounted worthy. Now, we just read these verses, but we need as much Bible as we can. Amen. But they which shall be counted worthy to obtain the world and the resurrection of the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. Neither can they die anymore. Amen. I like that. You think about that. You know, we all face death. We all, whether it's a loved one or it's ourselves, we're all going to face death. And the, by the way, the possibility of death at times frightens us. Hey, I'm a saved man, and I, I'll tell you, I'm a preacher of the gospel, and, I, and I'll be real with you. The possibility of death this fright is death is frightening, isn't it? It's frightening to think about dying. I mean, you know, we, we believe the Bible, and we know that, but still, I mean, we're thinking about the uncomfortable way to die. <laughs> it's like, man, I mean, like, man, it's, get your head chopped off, get caught in a grinder, I mean, get, you know what I mean? Get in a car accident. I mean, there's a lot of things, like, we don't like the process of dying, Right? We, like, we don't want to think of it like that's a terrible thing to think about. How frail we are and how frail this flesh is. Right? But Jesus says, remember, neither can they die anymore. You're going to die once. If you're saved by the grace of God here, if you've trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're only dying once. That's it. Right there it says, neither can they die anymore. Amen? We ought to focus on, we ought to think about that. We ought to rejoice in that. Right? Neither can they die anymore, for they are equal unto the angels. Hey, Jesus had to die. He came and he died. Right? You and I, we're going to have to die someday. Unless the Lord comes back first. Amen? We'll take that too, won't we? <laughs> we'll take that too, won't we? But if, if, if not, if we have to die, right? And, and we do. Jesus died. There is nothing in this Christian life that the Lord can't get you through. He'll get you all the way through to death. Amen? Why? Well, because he died. He died first. He's the first begotten of the dead. Amen? What does that mean, first begotten of the dead? He raised himself from the dead. Amen? That's power, friend. That'll get a bunch of Minnesota Baptists excited. Well, I hope, anyway. Amen? He, ra he raised himself from the dead. That's the power of God. That's the power of the resurrection. That's what God's people need to hear. You need to understand that. You need to understand it, and, and you need to meditate on the power of the resurrection. That's the power that we have in this life, 
right, is the power of the resurrection. But he says, uh, for they are equal unto the angels and are the children of God, being the children of the resurrection. You never thought about that, did you? I never thought about that till just now. We are called the children of the resurrection. That's who we are. When we die, we will be the children of the resurrection. That's another name for Christians, the children of the resurrection. What other apostate, devilish religion out there and all the false, fake stuff that's out there, the Mohammedism and all the other Buddha and all the other, they're all dead and in the ground. Jesus rose from the dead. Amen. Jesus is alive forevermore. That's the promise. Look at that. It says being the children of the resurrection, that's who you are. You need to remember that. When you're going through life and you're having struggles and trials and everything else, you're the children of the resurrection. That's who you are. That's who you're going to be. You know, we think about that. One day, we're going to heaven. You that are saved by the grace of God, one day you're going to see your loved ones there in heaven. Man, I think about that. They're going to tap you on the shoulder. You're going to turn around. There they're going to be. Whew. It's powerful, isn't it? Mm-hmm. These are those sons of God that were in heaven, you know, picture of them anyway. Think about that. These are those sons of God that shouted for joy. This is heaven, right? This is, these are the angels that are in heaven. He's not talking about, you put it into context of what Jesus is talking about. Jesus specifically says, well, marriage and heaven, they don't mix. I'm going to say that to you again. Well, marriage of a man and a woman. We're going to a wedding, amen. We are going to the biggest wedding you've ever seen in your entire life. Sorry, Paisley. This, this one's going to be the big one. Amen, right? This is going to be the big one. That marriage, when we get up there, you ain't seen a marriage like that one's going to be. And the feast that's going to come with that, right? And the rejoicing that's going to come with that. Amen. Boy, that... That'll get you, won't it? In heaven. But see, that's what Jesus is, the context of what Jesus is saying is he's comparing earthly marriage to life in heaven. It's not the same. Well, something happened with these sons of God. They didn't stay in heaven. They left. He said, well, you've got to have proof of that. Well, I'm glad you asked for it. You didn't. Right? We're going to look at some things. Some important facts. Number one, these angels were not in heaven. Number two, these angels or sons of God did something so traitorous, so diabolical that God had enough of it. Man had worked with fallen angels and God would destroy the earth. Turn to Jude. And not Jude chapter 3 either. Turn to Jude. Some of you got that. Some of you don't know where Jude is. We're going to... James is still looking for Jude. Here we go. The Bible says that they left their first estate, right? It says, and the angels which, excuse me, which kept not their first estate. They kept it not. Right? You know, the Bible talks about being a keeper at home, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Right? They kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. Look at that. Well, you know what your habitation is. Look at that. Think about that. Which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness, under the judgment of the great day. Well, well then, Jesus' words don't apply to these angels. Well, no, because in Jude, he explains that there were a group of angels that did something so heinous that... It angered God so much that God destroyed them with it. Well, he, he put them in chains and he destroyed the world, right? Their first estate was heaven, right? This is their first estate. This is where they, this is where they were. Just like your own habitation, your, this earth, right? Right? This is where God made you to be. Well, God didn't make them to be here. He made them to be there. Right. He made them to dwell with him. See, they didn't have what you have. You have something better in the fact that you were, that man is the, the crowning of God's creation. Right. Amen? He is. That's why God saved the best for last. 
Amen. That's true. And some of you might say, well, that was woman. You got a point. But you got a you, you got a point you got a point there right you got a point he did he did right amen but he, he formed but just so you know he formed her out of man so anyway but, we'll, uh, <laughs> but they were meant to be in heaven weren't they that's where God made them to be they weren't meant to leave and do what they did how did they keep not their first estate they left their own habitation their habitation was heaven so how did they leave heaven. Verse number seven explains it in Jude a little bit more thoroughly. Even as, so think about verse six, and the angels which kept not their first estate but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness under the judgment of the great day. Even as, that, that's the same way, just like Sodom did. Same comparison. Giving themselves, look what it says here. And cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication. That's what the angel, that's what these angels did. These sons of God, they gave themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh. What would strange flesh be to an angel? Anything not theirs. Right? Are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Whew. Wow. That's... That's rough. But here's a second witness to it. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse number 4. Look at this. For if God spared not the angels that sinned. There you go. We'll stop right there for a second. Who spared not the angels, right? Spared not the angels that sinned. They sinned against God. There was a group of them that sinned against God in this way. But cast them down to hell. All angels are not that fell are not cast down to hell. This group of angels that fell were cast down to hell for something specifically that they did. But look what he says. This is your second witness to that. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Look at this. But cast them down to hell and delivered them into what? Chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Right? But notice where he takes you back to before the flood. The context always goes back to the flood. It always takes it back to the flood. These sons of God, these angels, he takes them back to, that's why you can't just grab a couple verses of the Bible and say, well, no, Genesis 6 doesn't, doesn't say that they were angels, so therefore I'm done, that they're not really angels. That didn't happen. Well, you've got to consistently study the Bible. Well, who are these angels? And what do they do? And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes. So God, what, what's that eternal, remember the fire, right? <clears throat> That's coming, the fires of hell. Up here it talks about those chains of darkness delivered under reserved for judgment and spared not the old world. That's before the flood. That's the old world, right? But saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensemble unto those that after should live ungodly. They were set for an example. <coughs> Excuse me, for them to remember. That was an example for them to remember it. Right? They left their first estate. They were, they were cast out. They were cast out of heaven. So just to understand some things, number one, Sodom. Compare Sodom when he talks about that. He compares the going after the strange flesh and what the guilt was of Sodom and what they, were, what they had done and how God dealt with them, right? Leaving their own habitation. He talks about that. They left the realm of heaven. They left the realm that God had for them to be in and they sought out marriages of all which they chose. They were made to be in heaven. And the judgment of God came. And they were angels that sinned. What, were the fruit of that, what was the fruit of that union? We find in Genesis 6-4, there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that. Now, when we talk about the giants, we are going to cover the and also after that. All right, we're going to cover both of those. We're going to cover the, cover the pre-flood giants and the post-flood giants. 
it's almost like a football team, right? But it's not. <laughs> we're we're, we're going we're gonna to cover them pre and post, okay? We're going to cover both of those groups and tell reasonably as best we can how things happen and explain that because people ask, well, what about the giants that were after the flood? Well, good question. We'll give you the answers to that, amen, next week when we talk about that, Lord willing. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. They were men of renown. They were mighty men. These are different ones, These, but the giants are specifically mentioned there. Boy, that guy's ugly. That is not Dave without a haircut, although it does look like it. Boy, is he ugly. That is the ugliest dude. Well, maybe not. That's the ugliest dude. That matches Dave's coat, if you'll turn and look around. The back, he just doesn't have the horns. Yeah, that dude's ugly. You think, you think there's some creatures like that? I think there's creatures worse than that in Revelation chapter 9. We ain't seen nothing yet, right? There's going to be a lot worse than that. Uh, God, God already talked about those things that are like that, right? Those fallen angels and what they did and, and how they did it and how God was angry with them, right? And he spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. That's what God said, right? That's what he said. You know, that's, that's, that's a second witness to that. The goal of the fallen, fallen sons of God or those fallen angels, the goal was to pervert the seed of the Messiah. This is what people don't get. Like, why did, he, why did they do this? It was to mingle the bloodlines together. So that sounds crazy. Not really. I think, I think Satan's going to do it again. He's going to attempt to do it again with his Antichrist. I believe he's going to. Um, but it was to mingle the bloodlines together to thwart redemption's plan. I believe that. He knew about the seed of the woman. He understood that. He understood, that, and he wanted to pervert that, right? But the Bible says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. It says, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man. And here's, here's the clue to this so for us to understand. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. By the way, it says who Noah begat, too, because that was important. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. These, these three sons would, and, and would populate the world with their wives. They would populate the world after the flood. But the Bible says that these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man. It speaks of his generations. Why is that? Well, I believe that Enoch taught his generations. I believe Enoch taught Methuselah. Methuselah taught Lamech, and Lamech taught Noah. Not to mingle with that seed, not to be a part of that, but to remain pure in their generations. See, is there any clues to that that, that, that talk about that? Because that's a good question. Well, God warned Noah through the preaching of Enoch, I believe, uh, in, in verse number 14 of Jude. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these things, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. By the way, is that in your mind and heart? Do you speak ungodly speeches against God? If you're here not saved and never been born again by the Spirit of God, do you speak against God? Not to think about that. God knows. But here's something that people ask a question. That, you know, it's like, okay, well, if it was about the giants, and if it was about the bloodline, if it was about the seed, if it was about all those things, well, where is, is there any more proof in that text of that? Yes, there is. It's right here in Genesis 6, 11. The earth also was corrupt before God. How is the earth corrupt? And the earth was filled with violence. Well, that's a good way, right? What, what did the Bible say about the days of Noah? What is the earth going to be like? Just like it was then. It's going to be like that again. As in the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be, right? Violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. But it says here, all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. I believe all flesh was corrupted. I believe animals were corrupted. Now that may seem far-fetched to you, but it isn't. And God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. I want you to think about this. Now, I don't have time to get into this today. 
but I'm going to get into it another day uh, on hybrids. But look at that. An AI robot nanny will care for human embryos in artificial wombs. Wait. And then look at this right here. Beyond beef. Plant-based ground beef. Ground meat. What? Beyond beef? What is that? Okay, but, but genetically what they're doing, look what they're doing. Look, human animal chimeras, biological research and ethical issues. This is a human, uh, human animal chimera, chimera, right? Do you understand what that is, right? It's a mixture of the two together. It's splicing the DNA and everything together. It's putting the, the seed and the things together. It's, it's creating hybrids. Remember when I talked to, who, you were here, I know you were here, um, and you were here too, Carrie. <laughs> But uh, 10 years, 11 years ago, or whatever, when I first talked about those hybrids, remember we talked about like a, a pig heart going into a human back then and, and things like that. Do you remember that when I talked about those things? Well, now it's 10 times worse because what they're, do what they're doing is they are creating, they are splicing DNA. Uh, how about CRISPR? Editing DNA and everything. We, we didn't know about it. There was no such thing as a CRISPR back then when I did that 10 years ago. So we are going to have a, we are going to have a, a lesson on this, and I'm going to talk to you about this, um, about the days of Noah and hybrids and DNA, CRISPR, and all those other things. We're going to talk about that and because it's important for you to understand that, by the way, 10 years ago, I'm, praise God, I'm still teaching the same thing because it's right there in the Bible, plain, plain as day right there, and also we're seeing it in the world today. Yep. Right. Right, but this is all this is all done by look what they're doing. Right? This is just a few articles that I just pulled real quickly. And we're gonna we're gonna really talk about what's going on. By the way, it's not just this, it's the hybridization, it's also uh, AI mixing man and machine. Remember we talked about that way back then. We talked about in Deut in, in uh, Daniel chapter two. Uh, the iron mixed with clay. Remember that? Oh, you guys are just far-fetched preachers. You need to stop preaching on stuff like that. Well, I mean, there's an AI robot nanny that's going to care for human embryos in artificial wombs. Remember that, you know, that crazy ranting preacher that told you this stuff like 10 years ago? Well, there it is. They're doing it, right? So, in other words, basically, this is how all flesh was corrupted. I believe it was genetically. And I believe they were, why, okay, now think about this. Well, you can think about that too. But th th think about this. We saw that, right? We, we, we think along those lines. Think about Noah taking all the animals onto the ark. He had to take pure animals, right? And he took them onto the ark. He took the unclean and the clean or whatever. Why? Because genetically they were pure. All flesh had corrupted itself. I believe there are some very strange things going on. Why do you believe that? Well, because there's some very strange things going on right now. Wouldn't you say? It's not normal to mix human with mice. That's not normal. Right? Is it? I mean, what <laughs> Sorry, you're looking at me funny. <laughs> what's wrong with that? You're like, you're like, what's wrong with that? Why are you making such a big deal? Ryan's looking at me like, why are you making such a big deal? I thought it was normal. It's like mice and human are together all the time. What was that? What was that George Bushism? <laughs> Fish and man. I believe fish and man can coexist. <laughs> All right. We're going to get part three here. God's judgment on the fallen sons of God. We, we've established what uh, we're going to talk about their crime, actually, specifically what they were charged with. We're going to explain. See, that's something that that not a lot of people talk about specifically, but there's scripture for that. God judged those fallen angels, right? He cast them out. He said, you're, you're not allowed to come here anymore. Then he put them down into everlasting chains, right? That the Bible talks about those chains of darkness. But the Bible is very clear. These angels are these sons of God. They were fallen ones and they took women and wives and had children with them. 
right? The Bible tells us, and the angels which kept not their first estate, like we talked about, left their own habitation. He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness, under the judgment of the great day. That's a day coming. They're in a holding cell right now, right? That's where they are. They're, they're in a holding cell in hell. That's where they're at. He reserved them. Where's the darkness and blackness at? Hell. And they're being held there hmm. in chains under darkness, right? That's where, that, that's where they're at. Not allowed to come into the light. But God has them chained up for a reason, because of what they did, right? Think about that. Not able to leave, not able to move. They're in a holding cell. Yep. Yes. Yes. They get out. Oh, they get out. They got to be judged. Yeah. Right. But right now, and by the way, when they, when they, when those chains are loosed, yeah, they're going to be mad. Um, they're in a holding cell in hell. In other words, they're in jail. Right. A fiery prison. What's that? They're in a very long time out. But God is not like the U.S. federal government. <laughs> he doesn't hold anyone in prison without bringing charges against them. <laughs> God, doesn't, God doesn't actually do that. He doesn't, right? He doesn't like say, well, we're, they're a danger to the public, so we're going to hold them in there. What do you charge them with? Oh, we don't know yet. We'll figure that out. But we're just going to hold them there anyway, right? These sons of God, they, they have a right to a trial as well. They're going to get a trial from God. God's going to judge them for what they have done. He will do that. God, by the way... God's going to judge the sin that you commit in your body, too, if you don't get right with God, if you don't get saved by the grace of God. If you're here today and you've never been saved, that's, that fiery tomb is where you're headed. That's the promise of God, that, uh, that if you reject His Son, that you'll die and go to hell. That's just the truth of the Scriptures right there. Friend, you're not going to get around that. If these angels which sinned didn't get around that, but God cast them into chains under, under uh, everlasting darkness, and he put them in there, if God did that to them, he'll do the same to you. God's no respecter of persons. If you don't trust Christ as your Lord and Savior and realize that you're a sinner and you're guilty before God, and you've, break it, you've broken God's righteous law, right? And the Bible says that God is angry with the wicked every day. God is angry with your sin. God is not... God is not well pleased with man's sin. That's why he's judging it. And when he judges it, he will send them to hell for their sin. But here are the charges that were made against them. Job 4, 18. Behold, he put no trust in his servants and his angels he charged with folly. These are those angels. This is the charge. It's found in the scriptures. By the way, Job reveals so many things about God's creation. When you read the book of Job, he reveals so many things that we previously don't know in any other book of the Bible. But God allows Job through his suffering to see all these things and to speak on all these things, right? And, and, and that's what it says here. Behold, he put no trust in his servants and his angels he charged with folly. What is the folly? It's an absurd act, which is highly sinful. Any conduct contrary to the laws of God or man. Sin. Scandalous crimes, that which violates moral precepts and dishonors the offender. Shechem wrought folly in Israel. Achan wrought folly in Israel. Right? Let's look at some of those verses on folly, because then you'll understand that God didn't just throw these angels in there. Who, like, what is this verse? If this verse isn't, isn't talking about the sons of God that fell, well, who's it talking about? Which angels did he charge with folly? Surely not his angels in heaven, because they would be guilty and cast down. Right? They wouldn't be in heaven anymore if he charged them with folly. But he's talking about a specific group of angels that he charged with folly. Right? And then we can understand what that word means more when we look at it in context. Genesis 34, 7. And the sons of Jacob came out of the field when they, had heard, when they heard it. And the men were grieved and they were very wroth because he had wrought folly in Israel in lying with Jacob's daughter, which thing ought not to be done. He slept with his daughter. Right, without being married. That was fornication. That was folly. What, is, what were the angels charged with in the book of Jude? Or what did the Bible say they did? Right? They, they went after strange flesh, like in Sodom, right? Just like Sodom. It's the same thing, folly. 
Deuteronomy 22, 21. Then they shall bring out the damsel to the door of her father's house, and the men of her city shall stone her with stones, that she die, because she hath wrought folly in Israel to play the whore in her father's house. So shalt thou put evil away from among you. Folly. That was fornication. She had wrought folly in her father's house. Judges 19.23 And the man, the master of the house, went out unto them and said unto them, Nay, my brethren, nay, I pray you, do not so wickedly, seeing that this man is come into mine house, do not this folly. Well, what happened there, the reason why that folly was going to happen was, remember those guys went to the tribe of Dan and they came in and they, they were coming to visit and they, they wanted to rape him. The sodomites uh, that were in the tribe of Dan wanted to rape those other, those other men, right? So what did he do? He did what people in the book of Judges did, everything that which was right in their own eyes, and he threw his wife that had played the harlot out, or his concubine that had played the harlot, he threw her out in the street and they abused her. Right? Judges chapter 20, verse number 10. But by the way, that is a, that is a fornication. You see? You see the line. It is a fornication. That's the folly that they were charged with. Judges 20, verse 10. And we will take... Ten men of a hundred throughout all the tribes of Israel, and a hundred of a thousand, and a thousand out of ten thousand, to fetch victuals for the people, and they may, that they may do when they come to Gibeah of Benjamin, according to all the folly that they have wrought in Israel. So those Benjamites were trying to defend that, and that was folly. And God, and they said, we're not going to put up with that. Second Samuel thirteen twelve, and she answered him, Nay, my brother, do not force me, for no such thing ought to be done in Israel. Do not thou this folly. Right? That's, that was incestual. That was the folly that was being done there, right? And that's why, it, it, so, so that folly is described there. These angels that left their first estate, they were charged with folly. By the way, God hates sexual sin. God hates perversion. God hates those relationships and those things that are out of the marriage bed, that they are defiling. God hates those. God is angry with that. God does not like that, right? God has a law against that, right? And God will judge that, whether that's pornography, whether that's, that's, the, uh, that's a, pornography is a form of fornication, right? It is. It is a form of that. It, God hates it. God is angry with that, right? So those, those, those sins that are like that, God is angry with and God judges those things, right? God will judge those things. If you repent of those things, God will forgive you of those things. Do you understand that? There's forgiveness in God, amen? Jesus died on the cross to forgive your sins, amen? That's why he died, because you're a sinner. So God will deliver you from all those sins. There is no sin that you could have committed in this life that is greater than the grace of Almighty God. Amen. And you better believe God and you better believe that. Amen. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Is it possible that God would forgive that, those heinous acts? Of course it is. Absolutely it is. Because God is merciful. He absolutely is merciful. He'll forgive your sin. He'll cleanse you of your unrighteousness. Amen? There's forgiveness in the Lord. Amen? And you need to remember that. You need to trust the Lord, right? That God's forgiveness is real, right? Because of what Jesus did. You'll be grieved with your sin. Sure you will. And there'll be times when you think about it too much and that you'll be grieved even more with it. But you need not think of that. You need to think more on the grace of God. You need to think more on the forgiveness of God and the goodness of God that leadeth man to repentance, right? If you sinned against God and you say, well, how do I know God forgave me? You know by what the Bible says. You just have to believe God, right? Yeah, but I hate what I did. Good. Good. By the way, let me say this to you since we're on this right now. Let me say this to you about that. God made you as a child of God, to hate sin. 
And when you do commit sin and you sin against God and you're grieved at your heart, it's because you have a nature that God gave, a new nature that God gave you. And you can't sin in this life as a Christian the way lost people do and not be grieved by it. Eventually, the grief will get you. But that's why God put that in you. So you would hate it. Do you understand that? He didn't do that to torture you. Or you're saying, well, maybe I'm not forgiven. That's why I feel that way. No, 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 no. You feel that way because of grief. Because you grieve the Spirit of God. That's why. That's why the Bible warns us, grieve not the, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed under the day of redemption. I mean, you're not going to get away with sin as a Christian. You say, do you think Christians are capable of some pretty bad things? You bet they are. Unfortunately. But you know what they're not capable of doing? Getting away with it. There are people that do some awful wicked things in this life and they die rich and happy in this flesh and everything else. A lot of, there are. They're not miserable. And David even lamented those men. He said, God, they do all these things and they're, they're never sad. They have all the money. They walk around and they're happy and they treat people bad and they're rich and they're wealthy and they're, they never have the grief that we have. Well, no. Not in this life. Remember, Lazarus was tormented in this life, but not the life to come. Amen? But the rich man was tormented for eternity in hell. I would rather, I would rather go through God's grueling chastening for my sin to correct me and to keep me from evil the rest of my life than for me to enjoy sin, to love it and to live in it, wouldn't you? And then die and go to a devil's hell. See the difference? So if you're here today and you say, you know what, I, I'm a Christian, but I sinned against God. I, 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 I did things that I shouldn't have done. And I, and I regret it and I hate it and it bothers me and it, it, it afflicts me. Well, God allowed it to afflict you because you, we don't get to sin without... God will never let his people be happy in sin, ever. He'll never let you be joyful and happy and, and uh, live a life of sin as a Christian. You ought, thank God for that. Thank God and say, thank you, Lord, for punishing me, for, or thank you, Lord, for chastening me for my sin. Thank you for laying the rod of correction upon me and, and grieving my heart over that sin that I can't get away with it and live my life like that. Thank you that I'm not a bastard! Right? It preaches, I did preach a sermon like that one time. I preached a sermon. I'm no bastard. I have a father in heaven. He don't let me get away with that. These people that say, oh, well, if you preach and you believe in eternal security, well, that's just a license to sin. Really? Because I don't know any blood-bought saint that sinned against God and had the rod of correction on them that says, man, this is fun. Remember David's life? Did David look like he had fun with sexual sin? Only for a few days. Lived with it for the rest of his life. Hated it. Repented over it. Wept over it. Right? Was grieved over it and was chastened over it the rest of his life. But God will give grace. God forgives our sins. He cleanses us from our unrighteousness. But you'll always remember. And that's meant to give you that memory. It's not to torture you with it. It's to temper you. Listen, there, there are mistakes and there are sins and there are things that I committed in, in trying to serve the Lord and the things that I did wrong and different things that, that, that I did even as a pastor that I didn't handle correctly and things like that. And God chastened me and allowed things to happen to me and he put his rod upon me. And you know what? I don't do those things anymore. But man, they grieve me. They grieve me and God deals with me about that. But I don't do them anymore. But I thank God for it because I'm not a bastard. I have a father and he loves me and he's going to correct me. 
And you ought to thank God for that. If you feel that, you say, you, stop despising God because you feel that way. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. And you just thank God that he put that in you. By the way, it's going to keep you from sinning like that again, too. You ain't going to want to. You're going to remember how that felt. You're going to remember grieving the Holy Spirit of God. You're going to remember how you sinned against God. You're going to remember how you strayed. And you're going to remember how, you, how uh, before you were afflicted, you went astray. But now have I kept thy word. You'll remember that, friend. That's a warning. These sons of God that fell, this is a warning for you and I not to live our lives by our, by, by our wants and desires. There's spirits in prison. Look at this in 1 Peter 3, 19, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometimes were disobedient. When once the long suffering, look at where it goes back to. Who are the spirits in prison? What time does it go back to? The days of Noah. Look at that. How about that? By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. While the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. Right? Eight souls were saved by water. That was the flood. They were saved from the flood, right? Well, what are the problems with denying this truth? They have no answer for the origin of the giants. Why, why are they there? Where'd they come from? What are they? Why are they, like, why, do, why are they like that? They have to allegorize the text. They don't take a literal interpretation of the text. They never explain why the giants are always evil. Why there's no, there's no jolly green giant in the, in the Bible, there's no jolly, happy giant rolling around just loving God and being, being happy, right? Not green giant, no. There's no green giant. Green giant, remember that? Right? There, there is no, there's no happy giant out there that's running around loving God and loving God's people. You don't see a saved giant, right? You don't see well, it's like a good Christian giant, like 15 feet tall, pretty nice fella. Loves everybody. Right? Not, doesn't happen. Hates God. They're rabid God-haters. Right? They are rabid God-haters. We never see a friendly giant. Why are they always the enemies of God? They can't explain the purity of Noah's generations. They cannot explain how all flesh had corrupted itself. Why did the animals have to die? Why did God preserve a pure line of animals on the ark? Right? Good questions, aren't they? This teaching does not, by the way, what this teaching does not do is excuse man's guilt and sin. It doesn't do that at all. That's what people try to accuse you. Oh, you must be excusing man's guilt and his sin. You're going to blame it on the giants. Man, nothing in that text and nothing I've taught you blames any sin on anybody else but man himself. Right? But that don't mean that Satan doesn't work with them because we see that and we're warned about that, right? God called Adam the son of God, and he fell, right? Lucifer was the anointed cherub that covered, but he fell. Christ is the literal seed of the woman and is the promised seed. The fallen sons of God attempted to pervert that seed. That was their goal. By the way, there are a lot of false notions of angels and their bodies out there. There, there really are. You, you hear people, they, the way they talk about angels, I'll show you in a second the way they talk about angels. Um, angels are not like, what the movies portray them to be or cartoons portray them to be. The Bible shows us that they ate, they drank, and they appear as a man. They don't appear like this. These are, these are, not, these are not angels, okay? If you look at them, they're, they're not. That one does look kind of like Lee up there in the corner but with his tongue out. But that, the one with the tongue out up there looks kind of like... But, but these, these are not ghosts or spirits. That's not what they are. That's how the world and Hollywood and people portray it. So they try to portray spirits or ghosts or angels or whatever you call them. They try to portray them like that. They try to make angels' bodies to be like that. But the Bible explains to us what, their bo what the different bodies are like and what they can do and what they can't do. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 37. And that which thou sowest... Thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bear grain, it may chance of wheat or of some other grain. 
but God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, another of birds. There are celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for one star differeth from another star in glory. So also in the resurrection of the dead, it is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. Remember what Jesus did in Luke chapter 24. Jesus, after his resurrected body, he ate and he drank, right? Look what he says here in verse number 39 and 40. Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. What he's talking about is, is that, that his body, because when he would come into the room, he would say, peace be unto thee, and he would just appear in the room. And they're like, he didn't open the door. <laughs> and they got scared, <laughs> right? Why? Because he can go in and out of that realm. Just like when he was in the, with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he went in and out of the spiritual realm. He walked inside that fire with them, and he was in there with them, and it didn't harm him. It didn't harm them either because he protected them, right? But he walked into that fire like that, and the fire, the flames had no control over his body. Why? Because he wasn't confined, right, to that space. He wasn't confined to that. Angels aren't either. Angels can be there a second, and they can be gone. Angels can appear, and they can eat, and they can grab you, and they can drag you like they dragged Lot out of the city. They can do all those things. They can, they, 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 they're not just like, Casper flying through walls that Hollywood tries to show you or movies tries to show you or something. That's not who they are. That's not how an angel, and by the way, that's not what your body is going to be like someday. Jesus' resurrected body is what showed us, uh, what showed us, uh, gave us the example of how our bodies will be. Remember the angels in Sodom? Genesis chapter 19. And there came two angels to Sodom at even. And Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them. And he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet. And ye shall rise up early, and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. And he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in unto him, and entered into his house. And he made them a feast, and did bake leaven, unleavened bread, and they did eat. So these angels are sitting there. They had just left Abraham, right? They were just with Abraham and the Lord was with them. And they were just with Abraham and the Lord didn't go into Sodom. He sent them into Sodom. He sent those two angels into Sodom. They go into Sodom and they're going to, what's that? They, they ate with Abraham too, that's right. So they go into Sodom and they sit down with Lot and they're going to eat with Lot and they eat with him. Well, they, they, had a, they had a body, they're eating and they're drinking and they're, they're right there with them, right? They're not what, what most people try to make them out to be. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. So literally in Sodom, they wanted to rape angels. That's how rabid they were. That's how angry they were. That's how vile they were. That's what the Bible says they were given up to, to vile affections, right? So obviously they appeared as men and they were probably very good looking men. But also the thing about them, they were pure. And they could see that they were pure. And they wanted to defile their purity. I'm going to say something that will make a lot of people mad. But that's what sodomites want to do. Right. That's what sex perverts do. That's what they want to do. They want to defile purity. That's what the LGBTQ movement's about. That's what the indoctrination of children's about. That's what Rome's pedophilia is about. The Roman Catholic Church. That's, they want to defile purity. That's what they want to do. They want to destroy purity. That's, well, that's the spirit that they have. That's what they want to do, friend. They want to destroy purity. 
That's what I want you. That's what I want you to understand um, about them. They saw that purity. They knew there was something different about them. By the way, when we go to a sodomite event and we go to those places, they see that there's something even without our signs coming out or anything like that. They look up at us like, "What are you guys doing here? You don't have that. You don't have that queer spirit." They know there's a different spirit. They know it. I mean, right away. They didn't know it when. Oh, I wish I had the picture of that guy. <laughs> My favorite Lutheran pastor. <laughs> Or was it a Lutheran or was it Methodist? My favorite Methodist pastor that got mad at me at the sodomite of <laughs> that I have on video. His wife, rescued <laughs> his wife rescued him, yeah. I always show his picture, that guy. And I, I put his, it is a classic one. I wish I had it. Um, I have it somewhere. But, but anyway, that guy right there, right, that Methodist pastor's up. They don't, I mean, he's in line with them, singing and dancing and whatever gross things else he's doing uh, with them. But we're all standing there. They, they know us right away. Right? They know who we are right away. I like this practical argument. David Ickes brought something up that was good, that somebody had a, they had a, uh, a problem with this teaching, you know, and, and, and things like that. And, he said, and, and they said, well, angels uh, don't have blood, so it's impossible that they could, uh, that those angels let their first estate couldn't uh, procreate or whatever. I like what David said. He said, God the Father doesn't have blood either, yet his son was a man and had blood. That argument falls flat on its face. I do agree that men beget men. However, the sons of God are not men. There's a distinction made in the text. And why would this be relevant at all if they were just tall men? It would be totally extraneous information. They are directly related to the purpose of the flood. Why? Weren't short people sinners too? And then we see the direct attack after the flood of giants as well. Does God have something against tall people? <laughs> that's what we're left with if that's all we are talking about. The notion is quite silly, honestly. Plus, I think the title is misleading. He was talking about the post that this brother put on there. Satan didn't partake in procreation or he would have been chained in darkness as well. He may have been the mastermind behind it, but he wasn't an active participant. And then we have to answer why some angels are chained up. Why? What did they do? And so on. An angelic rebellion answers all of the particulars in both the real view mirror, the rear view mirror, and the prophecies. Fits like a glove with all the variables. Without the fact that these were fallen angels, there are way too many loose ends. And quite frankly, it makes the Lord into a monster. Believe me when I say that I've had more than a few discussions with unbelievers who hate God because they think he just arbitrarily ordered Israel to kill every man, woman, and child in Jericho. But when I inform them that this is an effort by the devils to pervert the seed of the woman and thus preventing the birth of Christ is prophesied, they lose their indicting charges against the Lord. I could go on and on, brother, but I'm sure you could as well. Good topic to discuss, though. Glad you brought it up. So anyway, he, he was having a discussion with somebody online. And he was saying there's a reason why there were four angels that afterwards, I believe, after the flood, that populated the, 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 the land of Canaan. Those four angels, the Bible says, loose the four angels that are bound in the river Euphrates. God bound those angels that had sinned before the flood. And I believe he bound those four angels that were in the river Euphrates after the flood because those four angels were the ones that populated the earth with, or the Canaan with giants afterwards for a reason. Because they knew Israel was going in there to get the land, Right? And they wanted to do something to stop that. So anyway, I hope that that, that makes sense to you. I hope it explains some things uh, to you about that topic. When we get into the giants next, we'll go a little bit further in explaining what, what, what they did and why God and just examples of those giants. You know, in the scriptures, all over the scriptures will show you that they were not, obviously not human and uh, completely human, that is, and that um, they were hybrids, and that's why God destroyed them. And there's a reason for that. Some people say, well, can you explain, uh, they ask the question, which is not a bad question, by the way, well, can you explain how can angels procreate? No, there's a lot of things I can't explain. I can only show you what I believe the scriptures are teaching us here throughout a systematic study all the way through. I can't explain everything, and neither can they, right? For instance, you can't explain how Jesus said, I have chosen you 12, and one of you is a devil. He said Judas was a devil. He didn't say you're acting like a devil. He said Judas was a devil. Can you explain that completely? No, I cannot, right? I, I can't. 
Is it hard for you to understand? It's, is it hard for me to understand how um, John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb? Yeah, that's it's kind of it's kind of difficult theologically to explain that, right? But God said it, so I just believe it, right? You know, because that's John's the only one that's that's said about, right? And John wasn't Jesus, although Jesus was baptized by John because John was filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb, right? And he was the prophet uh, of the Most High, right? So anyway, there, there, are things that, there are things that you will not be able to explain completely. You'll, you never will be able to in that sense. What I have to go off of is what God gives me, what I see in the scriptures and what are plainly taught, right? But people have a problem with some of that because it is taboo to them. You know, because it seems so far-fetched. Well, if they think that's far-fetched, when they, th there's a lot more coming. The book of Revelations has a lot of things that are miraculous that are happening. Right? And by the way, none of that is more miraculous than a virgin birth. Now, is it? I think the greatest and most amazing miracle of all is the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Don't you? That God would be incarnate in man. Right? That's the most amazing thing. And so for this, for me to believe this, like, is nothing. I mean, it's like, it's like it's nothing. I mean, I actually believe that God Almighty overshadowed the womb of Mary. If I believe that, I can believe anything that the Bible says. By grace, right? I can believe it. Because I, can you explain that? Not, not really. Can you explain, I ask the same people, can you explain the hypostatic union? No, I can't. Some of you are like, I don't even know what that is. That's the union of, of God, the Son, in the flesh, right? The seed of the woman. That's right, exactly. <laughs> And the reason why we can believe them is because of faith. Because of the Lord and His Holy Ghost, we can believe it. But when we look at those things, that people say like, well, that's, that seems really far-fetched. That's really a crazy teaching. Now, I don't think it's crazy. I think it's right there in plain, it's plain Scripture. All of it's just Scripture. I didn't give you the Book of Enoch. I didn't give you some legends and tales. All of this was straight Bible all the way through. That's all it was, was just the Word of God. Right? We've got to, if we can't believe that, man, we won't be able to believe nothing. Jesus said greater things than these are you going to see. You know, there's, there's things coming, like people don't believe in those kind of crazy things. That, well, what do you think about all those hybrids and all those other things that are coming out of the ground and all those weird creatures that are in heaven? Right. Yeah, fire coming out of their mouths. Now, that'd be some preaching right there. That'd be some preaching right there. Right? It would be. But that's all coming. All those miracles. If I can believe the miracle of the incarnation and the miracle of salvation, I can believe it because of the miracle of salvation. That's, I mean, I can believe it because I've been saved. God took some old, dead, wicked, hell-bound sinner and saved his soul and changed him and made him a new creature. <laughs> I can believe it. I believe it. Amen. That's that. We can believe that. All right. We're done there with that. You can shut that off. And then um, we will, I'll ask some kids some questions here. Some